believe it or not, not everyone solves their problems with their fists. Two girls? Two. Do you want to tag along for an exorcism? Yep. That's out of the bloody question, love. Well, we gave you its name, so you owe us. Well, I gave you your soul, so you owe me indefinitely. Hmm. All the more reason for me to help you. How is Fitz even here? I don't know. He just showed up out of nowhere with his own spaceship. It's a baller move. Not to mention the whole bounty hunter look he's rocking. I still prefer my cardigans. everyone welcome back to the fandom zone podcast i'm charles skaggs and with me here in the fandom zone uh is sadly not karen this week uh Aww. yeah because uh um, if you've checked if you follow karen on her facebook feed uh you know that sadly karen's mother passed away and she's understandably not taking it well, um, it's very hard, especially with someone that uh, she was so close to, her mother. So, uh, Karen, I just before we get into our normal silliness, uh, I want to take a moment and uh, just let you know that uh, I'm thinking about you. And thankfully, one of your closest friends, Jesse Jackson, is here, um, also thinking about you and was kind enough to... Uh, help fill in while you're uh, away absolutely podcast mom you know we love you you know we're thinking of you and uh so i and it's always fun uh to step in and hang out in the phantom zone so i've got my purple projector <laughs> ready to nice. uh, talk a little tv excellent so uh thank you again jesse for helping us out i'm sure karen appreciates it because i know uh, this podcast means a lot to her and it's, um, you know, and she obviously n- trusts you to, uh, take, uh, take over in her absence. So, uh, yes, Karen, we're obviously thinking about you and I hope everybody else is as well. We're keeping you definitely in our thoughts and prayers and, uh, we love you so much. So, uh, with that now on with the nonsense, there's no good way to segue out of this. So just, we're just going to dive right in. Um, so here we are at episode 132 for the week ending March 17th, 2018, St. Patrick's Day. And um, Jesse was kind enough to um, uh, agree to talk about some episodes, four episodes we're going to cover this week. Uh, we've kind of, Jesse, you may not be aware of this, but Karen and I have finally realized that our format is horrible. And we can we cannot keep up with so many shows, so we have recently decided to kind of kind of hit the highlights of the week instead. Okay. So um, so in, last week we did four episodes uh, or four shows, and uh, this week we're going to do four shows, two of which are new, different from last week, which is great um, okay. to kind of change things up a little. So um, so. With that in mind, uh, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about Legends of Tomorrow, episode 14 of the third season. We're going to talk about iZombie, the third episode of the fourth season. And The Flash, episode 16 of the fourth season. And lastly, Black Lightning, episode 8 of the first season. And hopefully not the last, because I'm digging the show and I hope you are, Jesse. So yeah, it really is. It doesn't feel like it's already been eight episodes. They they've been they just breezed right by, didn't they? They do. Yeah, uh, really great stuff. I, I I'm looking I, I'm looking forward to talking about all four of them. Yeah. But um, especially Black Lightning. Yeah, because Black Lightning this was a this was a big one because we have not one but two Pierce daughters with superpowers. And uh, definitely looking forward to talking about that. So, um, all right. So, first show we're going to talk about Legends of Tomorrow, episode 14 of the third season. Amazing Grace. How sweet the f- talk back, I guess. All right. So, this is written by Matthew Mala and Tyrone B. Carter, directed by David Geddes. And. Just to kind of uh, kind of a very quick overview, 
Uh, the premise of this episode is that the legends end up going back to 1950s Memphis, Tennessee, where they encounter a very familiar young man with jet black hair and a guitar. And that man turns out to be none other than Elvis. Thank you very much. I'm all shook up talking about this episode. <laughs> oh, you were waiting to use that. Yes, I was. I have been waiting <laughs> since yesterday when we talked about awesome. this. Yeah. You better be careful or they're going to put you in a little jailhouse rock. Exactly. All right. So, uh, yeah, the, obviously the Elvis puns gonna, are going to fly fast and furious, hopefully. Um, the, what, when, when you first were introduced to this episode – were you geeked that the legends were going to meet Elvis? I was. Um, I, I'm a little. You know, I, I kind of am curious um, how much they played with the. Um, the history. Yeah, because, you know, I kept waiting for him to do that's all right, mama. Yeah. And uh, they didn't, and I don't know if it's they couldn't get the rights. I don't know. Uh, what, I don't know what that was either. I thought it was interesting because we have an Elvis episode, but no Elvis songs in it. Yeah, and so um, I mean, yeah, he covered "Amazing Grace," and he, you know, yeah. So I mean, it's, it's fine, and he Elvis has a very notable version of "Amazing Grace." Uh, yeah, go ahead. But it was just it, it's. I'm fascinated by son Elvis and the early Elvis and, you know, and so I was really excited about that. I I was excited about the idea of how much rock and roll influences, um, you know, has influenced society and this not going on, I think is really interesting. Yeah. Um, Well, you you might be, you might be able to help out here because obviously with your uh, podcast, musical podcast set, Lusty Bruce, Free, yes. free plug there, um, the Bruce Springsteen podcast. Uh, yes. That um, the uh, you you obviously have talked to a lot of musicians and are music fans over the years, and so um, I'm guessing you you have at least some familiarity with Elvis. Absolutely, and um, and I just love the whole idea that um, you know. Quantum Leap used to call them kisses with history. Yeah. Uh, where they would have a little bit of I, person. I like that. Uh, yeah. And of course, this show em- embraces everything they're doing. So um, I-, I love the whole idea that Nate wants to show, you know. Um, oh, was, oh, you yeah. Mean, yeah. Um, uh, Amaya. Yeah. That, you know. Because she's from the past. Right. Let's go get this whole, you know, let's see what rock and roll is. Right. And, uh, yeah, so I, I I think it was great. Yeah, because she's obviously, a, you know, depending on, I believe she came out of like the around 1940. So she's about yeah. maybe 13 to 15 years mm-hmm. before her time here. Yes. And uh, so Nate is obviously, he's a history buff and we find out he's a big Elvis fan. So, yeah. so he was, it was very important for him to show Amaya, you know, how cool Elvis was and why initially it's kind of a letdown because his first outing at a, at a club, uh, he has an out of tune guitar and Amaya is just like looking at him going, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is um, a little awkward. Mm-hmm. And so, um, but you you mentioned that um, you were kind of wondering about the like how historically accurate some of this is. Yeah. Um, so I, I made some notes because I'm a little bit of an Elvis geek, not a big one, but enough to like I know, I know a, a couple of things. So I kind of researched this a little bit just to make sure I had my facts straight. Um, so when they were talking about um, Elvis's twin brother, we Jesse. No, yes. re- no relation. I'm sure. No, no. And uh, so Jesse, uh, we see Jesse as a ghost in this episode in his adult form. Now, 
right. For those who don't know, and I'm sure a lot of people don't know this, Elvis did have a twin brother named Jesse, but Jesse was stillborn. Yes. And on January 8th, 1935, Elvis's birthday, they were twins, obviously, but uh, only Elvis survived. Yeah. And um, so it's got, that was read... really weird that he had this big attachment to a brother he never met. And I, you know, one of the things legend, see what I did there, yeah, I um, see what you did there. Elvis legend lore is that he always did feel a connection to his ten, twin brother right. and uh, were, uh, you know, there's a great Twilight Zone episode where um, the Elvis, um, I, I'd have to look it up. It's like Return of the King or something where okay. an Elvis impersonator goes back in time. Ooh. And um, Elvis thinks he's his twin brother, Jesse. And spoilers, the Elvis impersonator ended up killing Elvis. And replacing him? And he had to do – and and so he did everything even though he knew how it was going to end. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's 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 a beautiful episode. Just, just because he wanted to live his life. Yeah. Just, his bro- his he, brother's life, yeah. Yeah, because he felt like he had to do this um, – so it, it, that, anyway, that's good, it's really that, good. That's a good premise. I haven't heard that episode. Yeah. Um, was I'll, that I'll, in the more modern Twilight Zone? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, that makes yeah. Sense. So, yeah, I'll look it up while we're talking. But I, um, this was once again a great um, episode, and and so much. Um, this show has done such a great job of knowing what it is. Right. Um, it has just enough humor in it. Um, that it is a wonderful. I, I, I love that um, that we Mick has become, you know, Jane. Yes, on this ship. <laughs> yeah, if you're I mean, if you're a Firefly fan, yeah, he's essentially like the Jane Cobb of yeah. uh, Legends of Tomorrow. And it's just, um, and uh, I guess we'll talk at the end. Maybe there's. Um, Rumors oh. that a certain character may be coming back if they get another season. Well, I don't think it's new rumors. It was actually confirmed by multiple entertainment news sources. So. Yeah, which is just delicious. <laughs> yeah, it is. So delicious. It, and, and actually that, that character is actually airing in the Legends of Tomorrow episode airing right now that I'm missing. Ah, I know. Uh, but uh, but thankfully you were kind enough. I'm, I'm okay. okay with that because you were kind enough to share your schedule to help us out. I hear you. All right. So and thank God for DV. That's all I'm saying right now. Exactly. All right. Um, yeah. Some other little Elvis tidbits about this episode. Um, so Elvis, when he went to go make his first recording at uh, the Sun Record Company, uh, well, apparently he went to uh, – this was on January 18th, 1953. Uh, Elvis goes to the Memphis Recording Studio at Sun Record Company, now commonly known as Sun Studio. And he paid three ninety eight to record the first of two double side demo acetates, which shows you how old it is on acetate. Uh, he did the songs "My Happiness" and "That's When Your Heartaches Begin." Neither of which are in this episode either. No, no, not at all. I thought you would think they could at least get the rights to those, right? Yeah, and it truly must be a money thing, um, and. So I, I that was when we get to ratings yeah. that will hurt their rating. Mm-hmm. I understand. I understand. Um, so let's see what else. I think that's. I think that's all the really Elvis tidbitty thing. Oh, one other thing. Um, they make a mention of this in this episode of Elvis's uncle. Uh, this uh, I forget what his uncle's Lucius. Uncle Lucius. Guess what? Yeah. Ki- guess what, kids? Elvis never had an uncle, Lucius. Right. <laughs> a little creative license there, to the point yes. where they we're adding to the Elvis Presley family, just yes. for just to, for the sake of the story. So, absolutely, you know. And of course, we don't know. Yeah. Um, in this version of Earth. Yeah. You know that well, maybe, maybe Elvis. That's true. That's true. Maybe in in the Earth One, Elvis he had an yes. uncle. Uncle Lucius. Right. 
So I guess yes. that's how we could get around that. That's good. It's not it's not the Earth Prime Elvis. Exactly. Yeah. Now I loved all the Elvis. I loved the times um, yep. stories, but yeah, how much is Wally West just precious in this episode? <laughs> Yeah, I was a little concerned how how well Wally would fit in crossing, you know, moving over from the Flash. Yeah. But um, with his super speed and this kind of Zen attitude that he has now, um, I kind of dig it. And he he's he, he and he seems like he's really quickly working his way into the team. Like he's they show this great scene where right off the bat where like he's playing video games with Zari. Who yeah. was kind? Of, who was kind of like the outsider of the group until her big spotlight episode, where she had this kind of Groundhog Day over and over. Amazing and, episode, just and, wonderful. Right. So then that kind of ingratiated her to the team. But Wally seems to be, and this is probably no side effect of his super speed. He seems yeah. to be uh, f- clicking with the team faster than she did. Yeah, and I, I love. Um, first off. <laughs> I love that Ray Palmer has been just the ultimate Boy Scout, considering, <laughs> you know, he played Superman, mm-hmm. you know, and everyone says, you know, Soups is the big Boy Scout. But not like you know, Ray, Roy, not like Ray Palmer. <laughs> no, Roy's chore wheel, which uses a complex system I pretend not to understand until he eventually does my chores for me. And, uh, you know, and then just Wally. <laughs> what else do you need? You know? <laughs> He, even, and, and, even the late Mr. Rogers thinks Ray Palmer is too white bread. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I just there this is truly a highlight of me yeah. every week and it's is, fun. Is it, is it your favorite DC show on the CW right now? I think Black Lightning would have that. Okay. That's fair. Uh, but, that's fair. But it's it's a close second. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. I think that's fair. Um, How about you? Now, I, I know the Flash always has your heart. Yeah. But. I mean, obviously, well, I'm a big time travel geek. So especially okay, yes. especially when you have Rip Hunter and all that. Um, I, and I just dig Legends anyway. And obviously adding a certain John Constantine isn't going to hurt either. Yeah. Uh, which we'll talk about here in a minute. But um, yeah, so uh, it's going to be close because. Yeah. The Flash has been kind of hit or miss when it hits, like this uh, recent episode that we talked about last week where um, they had Flash time. Mm-hmm. We thought that was a really good episode. Yes. It seems like when they're not focusing on the Thinker storyline, they have better episodes. Right. So maybe it would behoove them to kind of wrap that one up quick, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and But uh, Black Lightning, yeah, Black Lightning is very strong, and I think it's probably the best quality show of the CW yeah. shows. I, I don't remember because who, it's, what, it's the most real. In my opinion. Someone said, um, Oh, um, CW shows are one Adam 12 right. and black lightning is Hill street blues. I don't remember who wrote that I, either okay. Peter David or someone, but that's I, a, that I sounds like that. something Peter David might say. Yes. Yeah. So. It's, it's just, yeah. It's, uh, black lightning is that kind of next level. I'd say it's like, the the closest the CW shows get to the net Marvel Netflix shows, and uh, maybe some sometimes a little better than the Marvel Netflix shows, in my opinion. Yeah, so, uh, depending on the on the show. Um, so uh, yeah, so I'm digging that. But as far as Legends, um, yeah, this episode was pretty fun. Uh, obviously, it's you know it, Legends has kind of settled into a nice little groove where it's the fun CW show. The yes. fun that, you know, just like anything can happen. Um, all kinds of characters can pop out of nowhere. Uh, all kind of historical figures, like in this case, Elvis. And, uh, you know, they've had done like George Lucas. And, you know, so just, um, oh yeah, J.R. Tolkien. So, yeah. so um, the show gets a little crazy. And I kind of dig that about this show a lot. I do too. And, um, you know, you and I both, 
you know, plug yeah. as we talk time travel on our other show. Right. Uh, you know, this is just so wonderful. Why, you wouldn't mean Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. <gasps> I think I would. I hear everybody's talking about that yeah. show and they think it's the ginchiest. Yes, indeed. All right. All right, so um, let's see. So, uh, anything else about this episode you want to talk about? Nope, it was good, and I love it, and I'm, I'm really excited about what they're, you know, where they're going to go, um, and and this whole totem things has been interesting. So, yeah, yeah, good cause, stuff. Yeah, because one of the things we got, uh, we probably should mention, is that yeah, all of this, uh, we found out that Elvis had the, this death totem. Uh, embedded in his guitar and yes. um, the legends end up by the end of the episode, of course, getting their hands on the death totem, which they're kind of like kind of celebratory about at the end of the episode because they got it before Damien and Nora Dark got their mitts on it. So a brief act and rare win for the legends here. And uh, I'd like to see more of that actually. Um, mm-hmm. And then Ray talks about building a lockbox for this totem, but the lockbox is like, you know, very tiny, and it's like, well, you could just walk off with a lockbox, yeah, and open it later. Sense. And it, it didn't seem like much of a lockbox to me. No. All right. So, uh, what's your rating on this one? I am going to give it eight and a half mm-hmm. because of the songs. Yeah. Trombone warriors. Nice. I wanted to go guitar, but I figured that would be a little uh, too on right. point. Okay, that's good. I'm hoping you'll catch this reference, Jesse. All right. Um, so I give this one 8 out of 10 peanut butter, banana, and bacon sandwiches. Absolutely. Now, why is that significant? That is one of Elvis's signature uh, meals. Exactly. That's one of his favorite. He loved, he yes. loved his peanut butter, bacon, and banana sandwich. Yes. So, uh, and this was, they actually made a reference to this because they didn't come out and say what was in the sandwich, but Heat Wave kind of like was eyeing the sandwich there for a little brief bit. Yes. And I thought that was kind of he, like, he's kind of like pulling up the bread and going, okay, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I thought that was that was a funny little scene and and very sly on the part of the writers. But yes. I I caught that reference because I know about Elvis's favorite sandwich. All right, yes, indeed. All right, so um, next we're going to talk about I Zombie four hundred three, Brainless in Seattle part one, an actual two parter here, um, written by Heather V. Renier, directed by Michael Whale, and Jesse, you. Um, have been watching iZombie, but you haven't quite uh, caught up with, with season yeah. four to my Yeah. Um, you know, what I tend to do is I, I let two or three episodes um, build up, compile up. Yeah. And then, you know, on a weekend I'll catch up and then I try to stay like I had four or five episodes of Lucifer. Right. Well, now then I'm current on Lucifer. So, and, you, do, and, so you do yeah. kind of like a mini binge watch. Yes. And then stay up. Um, I Zombie is one of my favorite shows, and that partly why I'm not watching, um, because I'm doing that whole I'm saving the good stuff. Yeah, you know, um, I just this could be, um, you know, and I liked um, the uh, Elijah Dukush, you know, where she, you know, went back a day and took over, you know, the the body or, you know, lived the life of someone who died. I'm, I'm trying that. Doll, I dollhouse. No, not dollhouse, but oh, similar. Uh, um, dark angel. No. Yeah. So I I'll look I it up. I can't remember what that was. Yeah. Either. I might but, not have seen that one. Yeah. Um, it, it only lasted two, um, seasons, two seasons on Fox, but, um, which is pretty standard for Fox sci-fi. Yeah. Generally as a general yeah. rule. Um, she was, oh, wow. I'll look for it. That's okay. Um, anyway, um, she, true calling. Oh, true calling. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, um, and it's another zombie show. So there is no reason why this should be good except right. the greatness of Rob Thomas. Yes. From Veronica Mars. And I remember you being a big Veronica Mars fan. Yes. And Cupid. And so, um, 
and they have found their voice and um where they you know rose macgyver right really embraces playing the different characters you know because of the brains um i love one of the things they do is showing how she she doesn't just eat raw brains right right, right. She, she always she, she has a recipe of the week for these brains yes and this week and, this week is no exception because in this week's episode it's essentially she gets on like a romantic comedy brain okay and uh she ends up making chocolate brain candies you know like little hearts but with brains in in them so uh that's yeah. that's their, her recipe this week and um, sometimes they I do really just... clever things. Like they, they come up with like brain sushi or you yes. know, these really like if you're a, a foodie, if, you know, you know, a food aficionado, some of these me- and look actually very appetizing. It's just that you have to kind of like, well, OK, they're not really brains. So right. and... you might be inclined to eat them knowing that, well, it's just brains on the show, but they look really actually pretty good and pretty appetizing sometimes. Absolutely. Yep. So, mm, so anyway, brains. I'm yeah. not caught up, but I but, love the series. So talk to me. All right. Uh, I'll is, try. I'll, I'll try and keep this uh, like you know pretty quick because since you haven't watched the episode, um, apologies for the spoilers on this one. That's if, okay. If you if you want to like uh, you know silence me for a little bit, you can do that. <laughs> I'll, I'll just kind of nod or something if you okay. if you want. But um, so the. Again, this is uh, Brainless in Seattle Part 1, Part 1 of 2. And um, Jesse, you know, you, you're familiar with it, you know, how things have been kind of escalating as far as the zombies going, that, you know, the zombie population has steadily grown over the first three seasons, and the secret got out that there were zombies. And so this kind of, this season has kind of taken things to an, an even raised the bar a little more. By well, step by establishing this like entire walled off zombie community section of Seattle, this is kind of like a like a city within a city. Yeah, you know, Jason Doring was there last year, and they had the whole um, secret society. And then when they came out, right, and um, I was excited to see what they were going to do because you know leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. And so this is, uh, they've, they've kind of just taken it to the natural progression where we've, we kind of see life in this like zombie city now. And what I like is this show, um, is just campy enough mm-hmm. that you have fun with it. Unlike I personally thought Gotham you know, I gave up on Gotham because, like, I, I don't think they knew what they wanted to be. Right. And they were just a little too crazy. I know a lot of people love Gotham, and that's great. Right. Just for me. But this just seems to just enough, um, you know, I, I think there is just the camp- campiness and the funniness. And and what a great cast. Everyone oh, back yeah, and it's forth. A, it's definitely a great ensemble. Yeah. And, and they play off each other so well. Yes, and, uh, and and it's and it's a very fun show. It's it's not it's not a show that okay yeah there may be some like darker moments, but they don't dwell on them overly long. And, I totally uh, agree. And uh, you know just it's 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 a more upbeat considering well hey it's a zombie show. Yeah, and and uh, it's almost like a zombie dramedy, if you will. Yeah, and it just it it is. Um... And it's obviously, and it doesn't try to like copy from the walking dead at all it, it's its own thing so ken schaefer friend of the show hi ken uh, if you're listening. yes yes take a drink yep. um he you know it's he zombies is his favorite um genre yeah and he talked about that um the diversity of them doing this that you know, I Zombie is a is as different of Walking Dead of Z Nation. Right. To, each of these just have found their own way. It's not just another yeah. zombie show. And so, and I just, I'm I'm a big fan of this. Yeah. Yeah. If anything, I would compare this more to like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, 
Yes, than, than I, I definitely think. Than I would The Walking Dead, really, even though they're both zombie yeah. shows. Right. Um, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so in this episode, we have um, we start off with a guy trying to drive a young woman into Seattle, trying to sneak her inside the uh, gated uh, walls. And uh, there's a checkpoint. And uh, they pay off like a, one of the officers from Fillmore Grays, which is essentially the security of this, this little zombie community. And they get her inside. Um, and meanwhile, you have Ravi and Liv walking down the street. They're like complaining about how Blaine's handling the human zombie problem in Seattle. And Clive walks them through uh, this murder scene. And that w- young woman from earlier is found shot in the head with most of her brains missing. Mm. So the case of the week is Robbie performs an autopsy. Um, the uh, The murder victim is, is Annie Wallace, a young woman who was smuggled in Seattle for some unknown reason. They find that uh, Annie was frequently talking to a man named Alan Fox. And so, of course, Clive asks Liv to eat Annie's brains and uh, she cooks them in the chocolate candies, like I talked about. Uh, so they go in and in, interrogate this Alan Fox guy who um, live now that she's on a romantic comedy brain. Uh, she just starts staring at this guy longingly. And Annie, Alan reveals that he and Annie met online a month before, bonded over their love of romantic comedies. And Liv is just completely enthralled. Um, but Clive is of course suspicious and, and, um, Liv ends up asking Alan out to this human zombie night at the scratching post. So you're caught up to where the scratching post was created, right? The, uh, the, absolutely the, the club by that Blaine and Don E run. Right. Yeah. yeah which I think is, is, is pretty fun, a pretty fun uh, setting. For, for episodes. So so essentially, yeah, there's this human zombie night. Uh, Liv arranges a date to meet this guy. And she ends up um, trying to bring in Peyton as her girlfriend to go ro- shotgun with her on this date. And Peyton doesn't want to do it. So she's like complaining to Ravi about the human zombie night. She begs Ravi to come along with her. So that she's not just alone with Liv and this guy. And if you remember the history between Peyton and Ravi, uh, there's a little estrangement because, well, Peyton dumped Ravi. Yes. And Ravi was understandably a little bitter about it. Uh, Still has feelings for her, but I think they're kind of clouded at the moment because of the way he was dumped. Yeah, I'm I'm pulling for these two kids. Yeah, so just telling you, so, I ship them. Right, so they end up all f- uh, all three of them go to this you know human zombie night. Uh, Ravi just really gets into it, is dancing with everybody at the club, and Peyton's just like, oh, I think you should kind of hang with me, and he's like, no, no, and he's got all these women hanging around him and everything. It's pretty funny, um, but then. Uh, the guy, Alan, ends up standing Liv up, and so Liv is understandably a little bummed. So in a kind of romantic comedy kind of thing, the best friend drags the Liv out on the dance floor, that old trope. And, yes. uh, you know, so they have a pretty good time. Um, and then Liv ends up grabbing some dude that she met on the dance floor and starts making out with him and ends up going back and having sex with him. So, Ooh. so that, that kind of like, oh, I can't believe I slept with this guy trope of romantic comedies. So they're running down the whole checklist, of course. Um, they, uh, apparently Clive later finds out that, that Alan had a history of having guns and, um, I guess Liv sees a new female police officer named Michelle tries to set Clive up on a date with this officer which goes really awkwardly, horribly wrong. And um, let's see what else. Uh, Liv gets a vision of this coyote that uh, um, was in this van. 
uh, or this guy that uh, that apparently um, talking to Annie, the victim, and uh, Liv ends up like talking to the police sketch artist, and the sketch artist um, sketches the photo, but the photo turns out to be oh hey the guy that um, Liv slept with. So that gets a little awkward, understandably. Um, and then uh, apparently they find out the uh, the this other guy that they thought was the killer uh, was part of a group that smuggles people in to kill them and then drains their bank accounts. And then we have um, the the uh, I guess. Clive ends up finding out that Alan's guns that they think that, that they thought he was a, um, he was, those guns were used to kill Annie, uh, weren't a match after all, which means that, uh, the other guy, Bruce was probably the culprit. And so Clive and Liv go to a nearby building and they find, um, the, uh, that off of getting a lead off the case and they find a, a bunch of skulls. And then Clive announces to Liv that Bruce is officially a serial killer. And that's our cliffhanger. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. Or, you know, like they'll do the... <laughs> so. Uh, so it sounds like the show hasn't lost its fastball. No, no. It, it actually hasn't. It, it's basically picked up where uh, the end of the third season um, did not lose a single, did not drop a beat. It just kind of took it to its the next progression, the next phase of the storyline, and things kind of keep escalating in this. And I'm kind of serious, wondering how this whole house of cards is going to come tumbling down. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm looking forward to it. I even now, even more as you kind of share how things are going. Yeah. So yeah, um, yeah. apologies for again for the spoilers, but yeah. Uh, but yeah, so uh, uh, a fun episode. Um, kind of curious to see how. I guess Liv is going to have um, romantic uh, comedy brain in the second part as well. So it's kind of interesting that we're going to have uh, Liv on the same brain for two episodes. Oh, that is kind of fun. Yeah, so it's a little different. Um, we'll see how that goes. And uh, we'll see how this turns out. But in the meantime, I gave this episode eight and a half out of ten chocolate brain candies for obvious reasons. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you. All right. So, uh, let's talk into a show that Jesse has been watching. Uh, the Flash, episode 16 of the fourth season, Run, Iris, Run. Now, you have said uh, when we have talked mm -hmm. off mic that yes. you're not a fan of the trial of Barry Allen. Yes. Uh, it's, it's just a. It, the comic book storyline drug on way too long for two years because they were trying to get the character to Crisis on Infinite Earths where they were going to kill him off. That was a, that was more of a corporate mandate. The TV show uh, they ran they basically dragged on this trial for four episodes, putting Barry in jail and not being the Flash for and. So that was a little frustrating, and they, and uh, thankfully that he's no longer in jail, and he's out fighting crime again. But there are some repercussions uh, following his experience. He has Barry has kind of now become estranged from the Central City Police Department. Was put on extended leave without pay, presumably. And uh, not sure how he's going to get his job back, but presumably at some point he will. Hopefully, and uh, we'll see where that goes. But but or, this thinker storyline. Now, now, what is your take on the thinker storyline? Um, I think it's gone on way too long, personally. Yeah, I, I. First off, I'm very glad they don't have a speedster as the villain this season. So right. yeah, see, yeah that was, I'm that glad was, about that. That was a plus. Yes. And, um, I don't necessarily, I don't understand his motivation. Mm -hmm. I don't understand this. Um, well, I think he's got, he has a plan and we've, right. Kind of but we don't know tidbits. the plan, but 
But you know, it- so did the Cylons, according to <laughs> Battlestar Galactica. And yeah, then like, later, Ron Moore have- said, Ron Moore goes, nah, we didn't have a plan. It just sounded good. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it's like so, basically like Lucy with, yeah. the foot, Lucy with the football yanking it. Yeah. Um, I and his wife, I guess they call the mechanic. Yes. Um, you know, I think she's done a good job of kind of looking at her husband and going, hey, dude. Yeah, you keep changing bodies, right? And I'm and, supposed to be okay with this. And the last couple have been women, which I find yes. really interesting. <laughs> yes, because I did think um, when um, the first body he took, yeah, very I, good looking I, young, I, yeah, guy, brain, brainstorm, brainstorm. Yeah, didn't, yeah, she, she might se- go. She seemed like it was. She was pretty okay with that. Yeah, she's like, yay. Um, and then he dumped that for. Right. Uh, for um uh oh um hazard of all people mm-hmm. who's like all of like five foot nothing and yeah. and uh with this kind of like smurfette kind of voice, which is doesn't sound at all intimidating. So I don't get this. I do think it's gone on a little too long. Mm-hmm. Um you know, so I'm kinda putting up with that. Now what I like about is I love Ralph. Right. I think he's been a great addition. I think the actor playing him has done a wonderful job. Yeah, Har- uh, Harley Sawyer has been fantastic. Yeah. Um and so He's like a modern day Jim Carrey. Yeah, and I like the whole um this episode having um her have the powers I thought was interesting. Um you know, kind of seeing her work with it and him, you know, Barry having this stay behind, you know, was a nice twist and I'm glad they didn't keep it longer. Right. Uh, yeah, but it's that it's, was okay. it's a good single episode story. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find, and, and this could have been, I think a little, like it could have been pretty cheesy. Right. But I think they executed it well. Yeah, I think so too. And especially, um, you know, Ralph ca- saying, well, it's easy for you cause you're always here, right. you know, safe. And um, I also like Joe ex- becoming a new dad. I, I like his, you know, um, girlfriend slash, you know, Cecile. mom. Cecile, yeah, Cecile. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I like, I mean, I, I like all the characters. I like the interaction. I like, um, you know, Killer Frost. I really was unhappy. I did not want Danielle Pennebaker to become a villain. Right. I just I really like that character. I like the actress, and I think they've given us the best of best of both worlds. Right. That she is, you know. And do you remember the Rose and Thorn character way yes, back yes, in the seventies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that where this kind you know, of schizophrenia, this multiple yeah. uh, personality. You know that um, the villain is kind of like this dark. Uh, like hidden personality. And then when like, you know, the powers activate the, the other personality kicks in. Yeah. And I like the idea that she's sitting like a there Jekyll, going, like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Yeah. And she's kind of do, do they like her better than me? Mm-hmm. You know, and this, which I think is a interesting yeah. thing to do. It It is a very realistic discussion. So um, I think everything works for this except you're right. The villainous, it's lasted too long. They need yeah. to move on. Uh, and of course they won't because um, the way this show and all CW shows work usually is you have the same villain all season. There needs to right. be a big bad. Yeah. And I don't have a problem with a big bad, but I think the Flash in particular needs to, I think they need to kind of restructure their season along the lines of what Gotham and agents of shield are doing where they kind of break it up into like, instead of one big season long storyline, break it up Mm -hmm. into two, um, like, you know, halves of a season, Mm -hmm. you know, where you have like one threat, the first half, another threat, the second half. I think, I think the pacing would be better. Um, you wouldn't keep dragging out. Cause I mean, you have a character who moves at super speed and yet, it's been months they've been dealing with the thinker. No yeah. resolution. 
So and, and it, it just seems a little implausible. Now, granted, there was that little sidetrack with Barry getting thrown in the, in the slammer. So I can understand a little bit of delay for that. But it's 16 episodes in. You think we, you know, you know, the you think he would have been at least exposed as a bad guy by now, put to the public. And I also. OK, we we were. The Ralph is able to pretend to be, you know, the thinker, but. You know, how long is that going to last? I mean, that just seems like a horrible plan. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, from what I understand that, that yeah, that everybody's going to keep wanting to see the thinker again. So they can like, the, especially the CCPD, so they can question him. Yeah. So that could be a little awkward, um, especially given Ralph's personality. Um, yeah. Whether he'd be able to carry that off. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But in this episode... Um, so yeah, we we essentially had this prem the premise of this, like you said, uh, we have a power swapping thing. Um, I like this for the fact that it gives Candace Patton uh, a really decent spotlight. Yeah, she, she's not just behind the console at Star Labs, radioing advice to everybody, you know, yeah. or you know, she's not just you know talking with Joe, which I have no problem with because I. Any scene that uh, Joe West is in yeah, is, is pretty absolutely. much gold. Um, so I'm okay with that. But um, this gives her something more to do. And it, and it kind of gave her a little character development, especially in this episode where Ralph called her out for not being in the field, which of course she knew was going to pay off later with her being out in the field to kind of get a taste of it. Yes. And uh, she, you know, she obviously had her, she went through a little trial by fire, kind of literally. Yeah. In, in one scene. See what it did there? I um, did. And, uh, but she came through it okay. And, and it was kind of interesting to see Barry's perspective because Barry's obviously um, used to being the star of the show. And here yes. he is, he's sidelined. He's the one behind the console. Because he has no powers, has nothing uh, to contribute in that regard, apart from just his experience. So, um, so he's able to give advice to to um, Iris as best as he can, even though, yeah, she's essentially a freshman with these all these powers. So, there's that learning curve to to overcome. Yeah. But uh, ultimately, you know, with the whole sequence where the tidal wave, she has to kind of bring a controlled tidal wave tsunami in to uh, douse the villain that's on fire and uh, save the day, which she does. And I thought that was a really pretty cool sequence where she's running, I, I, when Iris was running on water. And they talk about, oh, I've yeah. never done that. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was really well done. Yeah, I mean – I. As a Flash fan, I geek out anyway because, you know, anytime you got a speedster running on the water, like, um, you know, Dash and the Incredibles or, you know, or Barry or what have you, um, it's a, just such a cool concept to me. And uh, I, I love the fact that Iris got to do it. And they had a cool shot where, like, um, she's underneath the wave coming in and it's kind of like a tunnel effect. And I thought that was really cool looking. And I, I, I dug that sequence, I thought it was really nice. Yeah, I totally agree. It's nice. Um, I, 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 you know what else I've loved? Yeah, is how they have figured out um, how to te- keep Tom Cavanaugh in the show. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I've been a fan of him since Ed, and mm-hmm. then um, you know, just anything he's done, I've just really enjoyed, and to have them keep figuring out how he can keep playing a character. Yeah, I just love that. Yeah. Well, last week, last week I thought he had um, a good, some good bit scenes with um, Jesse quick, his daughter. Yes. Um, I thought that was really well with done Vi- with violent bean. And uh, you know, I just, you know, some addressing some stuff like with his wife that, Hey, yeah, we don't get to explore much. We haven't seen that. So I thought that was kind of good to get. And here, uh, Harry, speaking of which, he um, sends, decides to invent his own thinking cap 
Uh, this in, and uh, it starts off not going so well because hey, the ha- the cap catches on fire. Yes, that was funny. That was funny. Um, so yeah, you, they have to put that out essentially. But then uh, he gets the intelligence cap up and running, and he pushes it to the limit, but kind of like keeps going on a little bit, a little bit too long maybe. And we have that kind of cliffhanger where he rattles off these names and it's almost just like, well, did he kind of like really screw up his brain or is taken over somehow maybe by the thinker perhaps? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I love that Cisco was worried about him. I think something's up there. I think they were, they okay. kind of set that, teed that up for a reason. So we'll see if it pays off. I'm a little okay. suspicious. How about you? I am a little bit. Um I, I it, it seemed a little off at the end yes, of the episode. Did. Yeah, didn't quite. Yeah. So yeah, I'm kind of wondering about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll see. Uh, let's see. Anything else about uh, about uh, this episode that stood out for you? No, um, a good episode. Uh, you know, I was really happy with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, um, oh, who's the mysterious girl? <laughs> the mystery Let's, girl. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Or do oh, you, yeah, yeah. you always know more than I do? Well, well, um, we, we kind of talked about a little bit about this last week, but, um, I even used the, the, the Roy Orbison, Roy Orbison song. She's a mystery girl that Bono wrote. Ah, nice. Uh, yeah. Cause she's a mystery girl. Yeah. Um, I love that song. Uh, so, Mystery Girl. There's there's really two theories I think that are are gonna, they're going to do here that that are uh, one obviously she may be the daughter of Barry and Iris, Dawn Allen. Okay. One half of the Tornado Twins that somehow came back through time to meet her parents, or two, and this seems to be the more likely one given her personality, um, unless they kind of integrate characters somehow. Um, Jenny Ognitz, excess from the Legion of Superheroes. Ooh, I'd love that. Yeah, I would too, because, you know, they have the Legion on Supergirl. So I'm kind of wondering if, well, maybe excess was part of the Legion and kind of slipped away and traveled to, um, to t- decided to kind of take advantage of this and travel to earth one to kind of, uh, check out her ancestors maybe. So maybe at some point in the future, um, excess ends up on, what is it? Earth 38. I think they called Supergirl's earth because yeah. of a super brand coming out in 1938. Um, so maybe somehow she ended up over there. I don't know, but, I just think it would be kind of cool if she ended up to be excess and she excess has this kind of like hyperactive bunny personality. And there was a scene in one of the teases they've done for Mr. Girl, where if you notice, she's kind of like writing in that kind of speed force language. Mm-hmm. That, remember Barry was uh, doing the symbols of the beginning of the season after he left the speed force. And, uh, you know, like he was having his own Phil Coulson moment, drawing all these strange symbols. Well, yeah, she, uh, Mystery Girl was drawing those in a notebook, if you noticed. Yeah, good point. So is it kind of like, well, is it, you know, is, is it just Speed Force symbols or are they maybe some f- future version of Interlac? Could be. So we'll see. So I don't okay. know. So. Just a, just a couple of theories I'm thinking about. Any theories that you have about her? No idea. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm... But I'm, I'm personally rooting for excess because I just want to see excess. I agree. Yep. All right. Um, but either way would be cool. All right. So uh, do you have a rating for this episode? Um, you know, I, I this was... Um, yeah, I liked it a lot. I, I'm going to give it eight and a half borrowed Jesse Quick masks. Oh, very nice. Very nice. Yeah, because you notice they kind of recycled that, just maybe spray painted a little differently. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> or maybe just Cisco has that fabrication machine or that 3D printer or whatever, and he just used the same template. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
Now I kind of wonder about that costume because you know they, if you notice, they kind of recycled um, uh, Jesse Quick's costume. It used to be, um, it belong belonged to another character they had for like trajectory that was in all of one episode before she got killed off. Mm-hmm. So so Jesse Quick kind of inherited her costume. And they stuck a flash emblem on it. Yes, absolutely. So, so I'm kind of wondering if that. Now that Iris doesn't have her super speed, if that purple and white costume is going to end up with Mystery Girl. Could be. All right. We'll see. So, yes. And, I don't, and I don't how think about we, you? I don't think we've seen the last of that costume. I give it 8 out of 10 flaming intelligence caps. Nice. Or I should say like intelligence camps, caps flambe. Yeah. All right. And so our last show. Our last show, Black That's Lightning. Right. Uh, the eighth episode of the first season – the Book of Revelations, written by Jan Nash, directed by Tanya Hamilton. And uh, Jesse, first, before we get into th- this particular episode, I want to know your thoughts on Black Lightning. You seem to be really digging it. I um, am so, first off, I'm a huge um, Chris Williams fan. Mm-hmm. Um, he he was in Friday Night Lights. Oh, is that where playing, he's from? Okay. Yeah, he played... Um, a very bad father. Um, and then he was hilarious in uh, heart of Dixie. Okay. Um, he played the, um, mayor of this small town. Um, so I, he can play comedy. He can play drama. So you were pretty, and, you were pretty pumped when you first announced, yes. heard that he was cast as black lightning. Absolutely. Uh, you know, um, Inspector Henderson, yeah. Damon Gumpton was absolutely wonderful in um, Treme, the HBO series set in New Orleans. Okay. So, and then uh, James Ramar, Ramir, yeah, uh, you know, who plays Gamby, a history of playing villains. Right. And to see him playing kind of their version of Q, even though this episode kind of added some layers to yeah. him. Um, just there, there's just wonderful. And then, yeah, he's almost like, the, out, like, um, black lightnings, Alfred. Yes, he is. In the- yeah. And, uh, so, um, so yeah, I mean, this is, I think it's a great ensemble cast here. It too. is a great, yeah. And, you know, I love his, his ex-wife, the two daughters, they are just, and I mean this in a nice way, bratty enough that yeah. that you know they're they're teenagers pushing their limits, right? But the same well, so time, especially not Jennifer, horrible. like Anissa's yeah. the more responsible one, yes. And Jennifer is the kind of troublemaking, you know, younger daughter. Yeah. So, and so uh, it's been great. Yeah, and uh, you're enjoying like uh, Marvin Crondon Jones the third as Tobias Whale, the big bad. Yes. Um, he is really doing a good job, and um, I think it's, I think it's just amazing you had like a black albino villain, and you found a black albino actor to play that villain perfectly. And, and, and he's good at it, and he's good at it exactly. Yeah, he, How I great mean, is that? Because <laughs> you're like, okay, there's not going to be a lot of yeah, albino yeah. African Americans flying for this. Yep, and he ended up being really good. Yeah, he's like perfectly cast in that. Yeah, they, they must. As soon as that, I, I mentioned this, I think before that, as soon as that guy walked in the door, you know that the casting director had to be going, "Yes." Yeah, I I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I thought that was um, great. All right, and go ahead. I, I I love the mythos that they're working on. Mm-hmm. You know, because I think that's kind of nice. It it could have been a very procedural, and there was a lot of discussion about people that, well, this is a CW show, so very quickly they're going to move where the daughters are going to get powers, and then he will be in backstage, you know, kind of take a back seat. Right. But it hadn't been at all. They've really worked on this kind of mythos and what's going on. So I, I've been very, very pleased. Well, one of the things I was looking forward to when I know, when they first announced that um, Anissa and Jennifer would be getting their powers – Mm-hmm. Uh, was this kind of generational thing? Because yes. obviously you have Black Lightning, because of the actor, he's he's an older actor, so like in his forties. 
So you have him with his his daughter characters, and you you they're starting to touch on this in this episode, which I want to talk about um, the training. So you have Black Lightning passing on what he's learned to to Anissa here, and presumably later to Jennifer once he gets wind of of that. And uh, I just kind of dig this kind of. Uh, and they've kind of teased this off and on during throughout this the um, season that Anissa will say something, and Lynn will be all upset about it because you know she's n- not a hero, and you know she's just like you know the mom, she has to be the boss, yeah. and Jefferson just kind of like kind of laughs to himself all proud like up oh, that's my girl that's my baby girl. Yeah, and um, and he's a similar, you know, I thought he played the father well. Right. I don't want her doing this. It's dangerous. And I, I do think it made sense when, you know, her mom, his wife comes and says, look, she's going to remember this is our stubborn. Both our daughters are stubborn. Right. So she's going to keep doing this. Yeah. And so we need to keep her uh, safe. Yeah, so it's just so, a question yeah. of whether – you have a relationship with her or she cuts you out of her life. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, so as a dad, how, how can you relate to that? <laughs> I, I totally can. I, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, um, I never taught Chris obviously to go out and, you know, put on yeah leotards and fight crime, but I have taught him how to, you know, how to drive and how to do other things. And so you do have that. You got to give them a chance to make uh, their own mistakes and everything. I just thought it was really well done. Yeah, I do too. And and I love the fact that Jefferson is kind of like a well-respected member of the community. Yes. Like, like he's the principal. And normally you would hate the principal at school, but the kids love him. They respect him. Yeah. And I, and I really kind of dig that. I, I like I like seeing that Jefferson is this positive role model in and out of the costume. Yeah, and um, I don't have it in front of me, but um, you know, Friday Night Lights had the whole clear eyes, full hearts, right. can't lose, and and I love his kind of um, mantra that he goes with the you know with the students. Um, and um, so I just like this a lot. I, I think that they are swinging for the fences and making it work. I, I do not know how it's doing in the ratings. It's doing okay. But, I mean, okay. all, all the CW shows are down, but um, mm-hmm. but it's hanging in there. It's 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 yeah. actually doing better than Legends of Tomorrow. So okay. Um, so hopefully we'll get a season two pickup. I'm hoping. Okay. Good. Um, at least hopefully for at least another 13 episodes. Yes. Uh, bare minimum, preferably more. Yeah. But, um, mm-hmm. So, uh, so this episode, uh, we, we start off with Jefferson and Anissa training in Gamby's mm-hmm. basement. And uh, so we kind of get that throughout this episode. So what were your thoughts about how Jeff was handling Anissa's training in this episode? So, <laughs> I am so glad they've given us a little bit of background of why this Taylor yeah. has so much electronics in his, <laughs> you know, in yeah. the lightning cave. Right. Uh, you know, because I'm like, <laughs> wow, this is not just a boxing ring where they're exchanging. I mean, they're, they've got virtual reality. They're kind of doing all this stuff. Right. Cutting, um, edge, cutting edge tech. Yes. Yeah. I think it was really well done. And I, I liked the fact that. You know, it isn't just you you have to know when to use your powers and how to use them and and the whole you we have to protect the innocent. Um, you know, I'm a big sucker for um heroes that do not believe in having collateral damage. You know, Superman never kills. Right. Uh, you know, in that kind of thought process that he's doing. So yeah, yeah I'm very happy with it. Yeah. And it made for a really good um Act, you know, kind of action sequence, you know, the fast, the, um, you know, the whole training montage. Right. And I love the fact that they use Carl Douglas's Kung Fu fighting. 
Yes. <laughs> that, that was, I, I, I mean, that's one of my favorite songs from the 70s, and I just dig yes. that. I, did, I just, you know, I thought that was great that they used that. I just loved it. I um, agree. Because um, that song never makes me fa- never. I never fail to smile when I listen to that song. Yes, um, I agree. So uh, one of the scenes I liked in this one was uh, where uh, it was just after, like, um, Jefferson and Nissa, they, they found that body in the forest. And they like Jefferson makes this call, anonymous calls Black Lightning. Well, not really anonymous, I guess. He makes a call as Black Lightning to Detective Henderson to pick it up. And then this guy in a suit comes out of nowhere with a, this weapon. And Jefferson goes to confront him, but apparently the guy in the suit like picks up this weapon and it detonates. And Anissa saves her father. Yes. From basically becoming dust in this like big crater that opens up in the woods from the, from the uh, explosion. And th- so they get back home and this is why I really like that. He was like geeking out that Anissa yes. saved his life, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> yeah. That was a great scene. You know, he's kind of all proud. Papa. You know, yeah. And he's proud and he's amped up and he's, you know, like, man, I'm just too jacked to, you know, I can't stop. And yeah, yeah, there's all this excited energy. Yeah. Yeah. hundred miles an hour. And, you know, and his wife's just looking at him like, okay, you need to chill. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but yeah, yeah she, he she, was she, great. Yeah. Lynn doesn't get it. So yeah. No. Yeah. And it's just, it's just this kind of relationship. Now he's finding that he can share with his daughter, uh, this side of yeah. himself. And so he's just kind of geeked about it. And, Probably Lynn's feeling a little left out in the cold, understandably, about it. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I thought that was interesting. Um, now, as you mentioned, we find out a lot about uh, Peter Gamby this episode. Yeah, and uh, because Gamby's had some a few shady scenes in recent episodes with Lady Eve, who has now ended up dead, and. Uh, some other things. So we find out uh, eventually Jefferson ends up confronting Gamby about this um, at Lynn's urging, as it turns yes. out. So Gamby finally reveals that his name is Peter Esposito, and apparently he arrived in Freeland over 30 years ago as a government agent for the ASA. The government created a vaccine in an attempt to make the residents of Freeland more passive but it instead created metahumans. So now we get an explanation. We don't have a particle accelerator here. No. But we're getting an, the Black Lightning's explanation about why metahumans are turning up. And I'm sure it has a lot to do with that research that Anissa was researching with uh, her grandfather. was yes. you know, Being the reporter was digging into. So I'm sure that'll all be connected. I think so. So what did you think about uh, Jefferson confronting Gamby about everything finally? Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the payoff on that. Yeah. Um, James Ramar, I thought did a good job with that. Yeah, I think so too. And, and his, um, concern and trying to convince them not to go out there and, you know, Jefferson, you've got to be careful. You got to be careful. And, then you find out, you know, we know why, but they don't. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, And I guess, oh, Gimby also mentioned that, um, that vaccine was making kids sick. So he leaked the news to Jefferson's father, which that's the connection. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess what else, let's see. Um, Gimby also reveals that if Jefferson puts on a suit and uses his powers, uh, this guy, Martin Proctor, will find him and kill him. And the actor who's playing Martin Proctor, a he is one of those guys that always plays a jerk. Okay. Um, so, so, so this uh, character will probably be a jerk. Yes. Uh, yeah. He's been, um, Greg Henry is his name. Yeah. He was, um, he played a, a bad guy in scandal. He okay. was the evil corrupt um, businessman who paid off politicians. Uh, he was um, a the dad 
of the boyfriend in Gilmore Girls that everyone hated. Right. Um, he, you know, oh, that he's guy. been, yeah, exactly. You know, he's, he, he's just been, um, you know, in, um, I'm trying to see what else I've gone through. I know he just has play. He always plays jerks. Yeah. And so, um, so this will be, this will be great for him. So, to do so that. he was what Tristan's father on Gilmore girls. If I remember correctly. No, um, the, um, not, oh, shoot. That's no, all right. Don't worry about it. Uh, no, no, no. It's the, um, Hutzberger, you oh, know, so yeah. He's, yeah, he's, um, the guy who ended up, you know, being her rich boyfriend. Right. So, um, yeah, he, yeah, that, uh, was Tri- that was Tristan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, Logan. Oh, Logan I'm sorry. Hutzberger. I'm sorry. Logan Hutzberger. Yes. yes, yes. Yeah. That's what I'm Logan. thinking of. I'm sorry. I don't know yes. why I said Tristan. Um, yeah. Yeah. Logan. Uh, thank you for correcting me. All right. Yeah. Uh, the other big storyline in this, uh, Jennifer. Major developments for Jennifer. I thought this was going to be probably season two, but they're pushing this through pretty quickly here. They are. Um, Maybe I they weren't, that... weren't sure they would get a second season. So they're like, okay, we got to do this now. But mm-hmm. so I'm kind of, but, but yeah, Jennifer, uh, she's hanging up some posters around school when her friend Keisha, the one that always kind of gets Jennifer in trouble, if you paid attention. Yeah. Uh, she starts climbing up the scaffolding, and which is, of course, very precarious. And uh, apparently, having never seen a superhero TV show, she goes up the scaffolding and, of course, begins to fall off the scaffolding. Yeah. You're like, what are you thinking? You knew that stuff was going to happen, right? Yes. And even Jennifer is just like, look, you're going to fall. You idiot. Yes. So credit to Jennifer for at least having the brains not to do it as well. Um, so uh, so she begins to fall, but Jennifer in, in this uh, fit of excitement begins to like display her own electrical base powers. Mm-hmm. And she uh, keeps uh, um, Keisha from uh, dying, essentially. Yes, yeah, she does. So, um, and in the process, she ends up like cooking her cell phone. It gets a little extra crispy. So, um, she's obviously in, like trying to figure out what happened. She like uh, gets her powers to activate a little bit in her bedroom, and then she later decides, okay, I guess I need to talk to my sister about this. Not realizing that her sister already has superpowers as well. Yeah, I, I, I thought that was a wonderful moment where they're going. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, you know. Yeah. She, well, Jennifer um, shows her like the phone, the, and like uh, she's just like, uh, and then this is looking over at her like. <gasps> yeah, yeah because, that because, was really well done. Yeah, yeah, but it has to like probably. Like now, this the question is: Well, does she finally tell her sister that she, you know, like Anissa? Does Anissa tell Jennifer that she has powers as well? I'm hoping so. I would think so. I would yeah. think I would think this would probably be the best opportunity to, to open up about that. And then Jennifer might be a little pissed, like, "Well, why didn't you tell me sooner?" In in typical CW angst. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Well, and sibling angst. That's right. That too. Yes. That too. All right. So uh, anything else about this episode before we move on? No, I liked it a lot. Um, I think they're really um, giving – they're really showing what a different kind of show. Yeah. And um, I think overall people have liked it. There's always going to be people that go – Oh, I don't like this, but I think they've been great. Okay. Um, yeah, so what's your rating for this one? I give it nine burnt cell phones. Oh, you totally stole mine. <laughs> uh, but you yes, really like this one. You really like this I one. I did. I did a lot. All right, let yeah. me see what I can come up with here. Okay. Uh, I'll give it eight and a half uh, satellites that display radiation. Nice. Okay. You know, as many shows as we rank, yeah, rate, it is um, kind of cool that we don't uh, overlap that often. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Well, we do, but that's okay. You know, I mean, no, we don't not do it, that many. We, we don't do it all the time. No, you're right. Just every yeah, so often. But uh, Yeah, every once in a while, yes. But yeah. Um, and, uh, well, it just shows that, you know, we just have different uh, things that catch our our attention. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, um, his saying is, where's the future? And the children yell, the students, right here. And whose life is this? Mine. And what are you going to do with it? Live it by any means necessary. That's that's so, good, good words to live by. Yes, it is. All right, and uh, yeah, I just I I love that Jeff's a role model to both his kids in the classroom and uh, in the school and uh, also on the streets. I dig that. Yeah, I I agree. He is just, yep. um, and he talked about that that he's done more as principal than he ever did as Black Lightning, and I think if if things had changed, he would have been happy never doing that again. I think so too. But now I'm kind of wondering if he's going to change his tune about that now that Anissa and Jennifer have powers and he kind of gets to share that with them. Yeah, I think so. We'll see. All right. At least until one of them gets hurt, probably. Yeah. Then he might have some regrets. All right. So, um, uh, we'll just kind of wrap this up right now. Um, so if you'd like to reach us, uh, if you want to wish Karen uh, some kind thoughts, uh, you can drop us a line on, at Fandom Zone Cast on the Twitter machine, or you can email us at fandomzonecast at gmail.com. Uh, we'd lo- any uh, kind thoughts that come in, I'll make sure Karen gets them. And uh, if you're so inclined. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, post a comment on our Facebook page, the Fandom Zone Podcast. Or you can reach us, uh, or you know, drop us a line on a, or a review on iTunes. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, please rate and review us if you're so inclined. Uh, we would definitely appreciate that. And if you could like us or follow us on Twitter or Facebook, that would be awesome as well. You guys are the best. And if you've already done so, thank you so much. For those of you who haven't yet, please consider doing so. We we definitely appreciate that. And Jesse. Where can they can find you on the interwebs? Well, um, I am on Twitter at Jesse Jackson DFW. You can hear me talk to Charles about um, a certain British TV show, Doctor Who. Yes, yes. On Next Stop Everywhere, you can hear Charles and I talk on our new podcast, Titan Talk, where we go full circle. Yep. And I'll just leave it at that. You should listen to the podcast so you'll know why we're saying that. And then um, I also still do my Set Lusting Bruce, which is a Bruce Springsteen slash music podcast. Um, and so you can – all of them are on iTunes or wherever. They're all Southgate Media um, podcasts. So please check us out and go like us on iTunes because it really does make a difference. It does. And, uh, yeah, and also, you know, um, help Rob Southgate, you know, keep the lights on for our podcast. Yes. So definitely support that. Um, and Charles, how about you? Uh, as for me, I'm at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine, at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram, Google Plus for all you crazy kids in the Google Plus. Shout out to Karen. Um, Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs. And my blog, Geeky Things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot, where I talk about all the shows that we talk about here on the Phantom Zone podcast and more. All kinds of comic book and sci-fi goodness. And uh, just posted some news that a certain John Constantine, Matt Ryan's character, will be joining The Legends of Tomorrow as a season series regular. Um... Provided that the show gets picked up for season four, which all indications are, yes, it's going to be coming back for season four. So if you've enjoyed the uh, John Constantine appearances on Legends of Tomorrow so far, uh, including tonight's episode as we record this, uh, you'll be happy to know that Matt Ryan is coming back and we'll get more. So it's not quite Constantine season two, but uh, it's close. Yeah, I think that's great. I I think he was wonderful earlier in the um, you know this the season, and so I think that's going to be great news for yeah. us. Yeah, I got to. I mean, I was kind of or I was lucky enough to meet Matt Ryan at Wizard World Cleveland and got his autograph, 
and he's a great guy. Um, very friendly and outgoing with his fans. Would we'll definitely will take the time to talk to you. And uh, so good things happen to good people. And, and uh, I will tell you that uh, two or three years ago, David Anders was at um, Comic Palooza. Yeah. And they he was a hoot. Um, he was one of the first people that, um, oh, you don't have to go pay a big bucks for a uh, photo. Let's just hear. Yeah. Just let's hear. Here's a little – just give me a little token and we'll do it from your phone. He talked about that, you know, I, I'm just trying to make a little money. <laughs> I'm not a bad guy. I, you know, he was very funny. That's good. And just everything about it. So, yeah. yeah good I, stuff. I look forward to meeting him. So so in honor of David L. Anders, uh, or I'll do this. What is this bizarre segue that's happening right now? <laughs> Can we maybe stay on point? Thank you. Thank okay. you, Blaine. So I had to do a little Blaine for that. So Very nice. that's good to know because, yeah, I, 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 hopefully I'll get to meet him at some point. Uh, so hopefully he comes out Ohio way. That would be great. Yes. All right. Um, so, yeah. If, oh, and if you want to catch me on my other podcasts, uh, obviously you can catch me on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast that Jesse talked about, or Titan Talk, the Titans podcast that Jesse talked about, where we talk uh, all about uh, DC Comics Titans and uh, – the upcoming Titans TV series for the DC Digital Service. Uh, we're kind of building up to that. We just recorded episode four last night with friend of the show, Phil Parrish. So hi, Phil. And um, looking forward to getting that out. So if you're a fan of the Phantom Zone, uh, please consider checking out Titan Talk. I'm sure Jesse and I would definitely appreciate that. We would. And please tell your friends about us. We'd appreciate that as well. We want to spread the word, my people. So uh, I think that'll about do it. Uh, once again, our kind thoughts and prayers going out to Karen right now. And uh, we hope you did you good this episode, Podcast Mom. And, yeah, we love uh, you, Karen. We love you, Karen. And uh, Jesse, anything you'd like to say before we head out? As always, keep hope alive. Go rate and review us. And uh, keep enjoying this golden age of, of superhero TV. Exactly. Thank you again, my friend, for helping us out, and I hope you had fun. I had fun. I did. And uh, we'll see you next time right here on the Phantom Zone Podcast. Bye, everybody. <laughs>